instead of just charging a single price for their product, what a lot of businesses are able to do is to discriminate among their customers and to charge different prices. So let's see how that works. First, let's just quickly review what I'll just call the single price strategy. So this is the case where the firm just charges a single profit maximizing price. That's the case we've just looked at, uh, the case of a monopoly, which in this case, I've just described marginal costs as uh, constant. In this case, the monopoly has reduced the amount that it supplies uh, and will charge this price for its product. And as I reviewed uh, in the previous uh, uh, slides, this is going to be the amount of consumer surplus that's left. And what the monopolist has essentially done is to charge a price uh, above their marginal costs. So this amount here that I've uh, shaded in uh, in light green is an amount that's going to be adding to the firm's profits. So it's uh, a difference between the price and the marginal cost of producing the product. So that revenue uh, can go towards covering the firm's other costs, not just its marginal costs, but uh, maybe any fixed costs that the firm might have, for example. That is, costs that don't vary with the amount that uh, the firm is producing. Well, let's uh, just classify some different types of price discrimination. So the whole idea of discrimination is to charge different prices to different people. And it's very important to realize that uh, these are different prices for exactly the same product. In other words, uh, the price differences don't reflect cost differences. If they do, then that's, uh, that's why prices are different, uh, perhaps because costs are different. Just spend a minute uh, thinking uh, of some examples in which different people pay different prices for exactly the same thing. If you think about it, you realize that this is really quite common. I'm going to begin by considering a very extreme example. Um, that's a type of price discrimination called perfect price discrimination. That's the idea that every single individual buying the product may pay a different price. And let's just contrast that with other types of price discrimination before we look at this in some detail. Another common type of price discrimination is to give people choices about what they want to buy or how much they want to buy. And in that way, they reveal their willingness to pay because maybe the seller doesn't know how much people value the product, how much they would be willing to pay. If you can make a guess about who's willing to pay more and who's willing to pay less or who's able to pay less, then you could offer different prices to different people, but you'd need to be able to uh, separate out your market into uh, those different categories. So maybe you'd need to be able to look at people uh, or get them to identify themselves. So maybe senior citizens would be charged a different price than uh, adults who might be charged a different price than children and so on. 
Okay, let's just consider individualized pricing or the idea of perfect price discrimination. One situation in which that happens is a situation where the buyer and the seller are bargaining. So uh, an individual can come along and wants to buy a product and the seller uh, might sell exactly the same thing to different people for different prices. That's the sort of thing that happens in markets in countries like this one here in Morocco. This is a, uh, a famous souk or uh, uh, market in the city of Marrakesh. So in a place like this, if you're a tourist, uh, you will go into this market and uh, you will have to bargain over the price of absolutely everything. And presumably the seller is going to have a look at you, uh, maybe ask you where you're from, uh, look at your clothes, uh, figure out uh, how much you might be willing to pay for whatever it is that they're selling. And so you will have to uh, uh, endure the hassle of bargaining over the prices of things. Of course, it's going to be different for local people who will be repeat customers. They'll know the individual sellers and they're going to get far, uh, far different prices than the tourists will get. Now, suppose that the seller is very good at determining what the price is, what the maximum price is that somebody would be willing to pay. That is the case of what's called perfect price discrimination. So let's imagine that we've got a market in which we've got different individuals and let's line them up in order of their willingness to pay. So there's somebody who's willing to pay a very high price for something, somebody who's willing to pay a little bit less, and so on and so forth, all the way down here. And suppose that the seller is able to identify the maximum willingness to pay for each individual. Then the seller could charge a different price to each individual and could capture this entire consumer surplus. Now you might ask, well, why would somebody buy something if they don't get any surplus? So perhaps we could suppose that the seller is uh, leaving them with a surplus of five cents or something like that. Uh, so logically speaking, somebody will buy something if they're going to at least get a little surplus. So the difference between marginal cost and the price that uh, the seller is receiving is an amount that is adding to the seller's profits. And it's also uh, consumer surplus that would be captured by the seller uh, compared to a situation in which uh, the price was simply set equal to marginal cost which would be the case in a competitive market. So if we compare that to the single price strategy, uh, two conclusions emerge. Now let's look at this picture carefully. What I've shown here is uh, the demand curve and the marginal revenue curve that would occur if the firm were simply going to charge a single price for its product. If the firm is charging a different price for every unit that it sells, then for each additional unit that it sells at some different price, that is simply describing what its marginal revenue is going to be. So, in this case of perfect price discrimination, the demand curve just shows us the firm's marginal revenues. 
And obviously the firm is going to be willing to keep on selling product to uh, customers as long as the price it can get for the next unit that it's selling is greater than or equal to its marginal cost. And remember, compared to my previous explanation, there's no price effect here. If the firm, uh, the seller lowers its price to uh, sell another unit to somebody else, then it doesn't have to uh, lower its price on the previous units that it sold. So everybody gets their own individual price. So in that situation, two things happen. First, this consumer surplus that the buyers were left with under the monopoly that just charged a single price, uh, that, that consumer surplus is gone. That's been captured by the seller. And compared with the monopoly situation where this was the amount that was produced, we can see that the perfectly discriminating seller is willing to sell more of the product. So that's going to add more to the seller's profits because there's a difference between what the seller is adding to its revenues and what it's adding to its costs. So that must be contributing to its profits. And of course, as I explained before, uh, no sales are going to take place beyond this point. Well, I'm just going to give you um, a rather notorious example. If you look at uh, large private universities in the United States, often called Ivy League universities, universities like Yale, pictured here, they have official prices that they charge, uh, but then everybody gets a different price, as I'll now explain. So if you were to go to the Yale University website, you would see that their undergraduate tuition uh, for this, this current uh, academic year is $55,540 US. And you can expect an additional $16,600 in costs to live in residence at Yale. So you have a room and uh, some food to eat and you have expenses for books. So obviously a rather expensive place to go. But they do offer uh, assistance based on need. So let's see what that amounts to and see how price discrimination works. So officially it costs just over $72,000 to go to Yale if you paid the full tuition and you paid your expenses. Now, you can also look at the university's website and it describes what's called need-based aid. So, you tell them information about your financial situation and the financial situation of your parents you have to provide them with a tremendous amount of information about your financial, uh, your family's financial situation, and then you can read. Uh, you can read what it says here. It says if a student is awarded financial aid, then that amount is included in the letter, and the scholarship can vary from a few hundred dollars, which is obviously no big deal to over $70,000 per year. So you might essentially get this entirely paid for. And they say the average scholarship uh, comes in at over $50,000. So 
on average, even with needs-based uh, assistance, um, there's expenses of uh, about $22,000, or say at least $20,000 US. Now, what they're doing here is gathering a lot of information about, uh, about your family and about your family's ability to pay. And you have to disclose, uh, as I say, a, a, an awful lot of information to them. And that gives them a sense of how much they can squeeze out of you. So this looks all very nice. They're going to help you out uh, based on your, your need. But what they're really doing is determining what is your willingness to pay? What's your maximum willingness to pay? And they're going to try to uh, get as much out of you as they can. Maybe uh, in some cases they can't really get anything, uh, so they'll let you come there. Uh, but in many cases they may give you nothing or just a token amount of a few hundred dollars. So. If you're somebody like this, this is, uh, I don't know if you can recognize him. This is the well-known war criminal, uh, George W. Bush, who went to Yale as a student. He came from a very rich family and he was stupid. So uh, I don't think uh, he got any assistance either on the basis of need or on the basis of merit. But I am emphasizing that basically this is the idea of perfect price discrimination. So each student who goes to Yale could get a different amount of need-based financial aid, ranging from nothing to uh, the entire amount. Okay, well in the next slide, I will, a set of slides, I'll consider different kind of price discrimination.